Good afternoon. I'll let you all get in your seats. Welcome again to our Great Decisions, the fourth class. I'm Charlotte Kinney. I'm the coordinator of the Great Decisions program here in Carlisle. I have a few notes to go over with you first before we start. The first one is make sure your cell phones are turned off or any other electronic devices. I have my clipboards up here. You're probably tired of seeing them if you've been coming to all of them. Uh, but if you're new, would you sign up on the back? Because what I do is I send out emails uh, telling about which program is coming up to keep you updated. And if it's the first time you've been here but you're on my email list, will you check and be sure your name and everything is correct? And these are both the same. You only have to do one. We also have this from the Army War College, and I'll put them on the back. It's a little card that tells where you can find all of the programs from the Army War College, all their websites and everything. So I'll put them out in the back, and you can pick them up at the, uh, during the break. And don't forget, if it's Carlisle schools are closed for snow, then we will be. And so far, we've only missed one, and that's, that's great. <laughs> Well, now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker for today. Professor Dwight Raymond is from the Peacekeeping and Stability Operations Institute at the Army War College, known as PKSOI. His area of interest are in protection of civilians, stability operations, peacekeeping, military and government planning, and many other things. Professor Raymond joined PKSOI in 2009 after he retired from the Army as an infantry colonel. During his time in the Army, he served in the infantry leadership command and staff positions. He was also on the faculty at the U.S. Military Academy and here at the Army War College. In addition to many other high-level positions, he also was an advisor to an Iraqi Army Brigade. Professor Raymond received his BS degree from the U.S. Army Military Academy. He also has three master's degrees, one from the University of Maryland School of Public Affairs and two others from the U.S. Army School of Advanced Military Studies and the Army War College. He has developed military doctrine related to civilian casualty mitigation and protection of civilians and he is also the primary author of several military handbooks and reference guides. Today, Professor Raymond will speak to us on humanitarian intervention. Please join me in welcoming Professor Raymond. Okay, thanks. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Uh, this is the agenda that I'm going to be following. Uh, basically, uh, what I'll do, I'll start with some uh, obligatory backflips about terminology and definitions and those sorts of things, and I'll delve into some of the more complex issues related to humanitarian intervention. Um, I'm going to refer fairly extensively to your homework assignment, the article by Thomas Weiss, and also the book that he wrote, on humanitarian intervention uh, in which he goes into some more detail on some of the same issues that he talked about in the, uh, in the article. Um, and let me uh, preface my remarks uh, with a disclaimer that uh, you know, these opinions and views are exclusively my own. They're not attributable to any responsible source uh, like uh, the, the War College or PKSOI or, or any other U.S. governmental uh, organization. Uh, first, let's talk about some of the definitional uh, things. Uh, and when I talk about humanitarian intervention, uh, I'm not really going to talk about humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, those sorts of things, but more a situation in which military force is coercively applied to achieve humanitarian uh, 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 ends. Now, the term humanitarian intervention may not be the best of all terms. Um, 
there are those, uh, including in the global south and elsewhere, that would see this as a euphemism for colonialism and would object to it on, on those grounds. There's um, also a community that views itself as humanitarians, you know, capital H, and they would, by definition, say that anything that involves the military can't be humanitarian. That um, at, at, at worst case, the, the, using the expression humanitarian intervention is, could be a cynical hijacking of the term for political purposes or window dressing. And in the best of cases, even if they see the military as doing good things, like providing uh, relief to uh, people as a result of natural disasters, that's good, but it's not humanitarian because it's the military uh, uh, that's doing it and the military is not a humanitarian organization. Now, uh, Weiss in his book uh, talks about the difficulties with this term, humanitarian intervention, and, and goes roundabout and comes up with some uh, alternative suggestions um, or looks at some alternative suggestions like um, military intervention for humanitarian purposes and other potential candidates and eventually settles on, okay, well, now that you all understand that there's problems with the term humanitarian intervention, I'm going to use it anyway. And that's kind of what I'm going to do here. So if there are any of you that, you know, kind of uh, uh, just sort of instinctively react negatively to the uh, expression humanitarian intervention, your, your concerns are noted, but we're going to uh, press on. But there's, there's kind of like two underlying questions in, the, in this field. First of all, can military force be legitimized for situations outside of national defense or, or uh, self-defense, strictly speaking, um, for humanitarian purposes? And there's two uh, main categories of objections to that. One is the sovereignty issues. You know, can you go into some other uh, country and uh, try to set things right in your view of things? And the other one has to do with uh, using um, force um, in a way aggressively when it's not in the situation of your own self-defense. And then the other question related to this is does the use of military force ultimately do more harm than good? And, and that's a concern by, uh, by many. Um, you see on the slide uh, some of the accepted principles of humanitarianism, humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and operational independence. And um, many, of, many humanitarian actors, uh, non-governmental organizations, and, and uh, uh, some human rights organizations and humanitarian organizations that might work for the UN or, or elsewhere um, would view their activities as being, or as, as they should be separate from any political or military um, uh, effort. In other words, uh, uh, and that's what they mean by operational in independence and neutrality. They don't take sides. They go, they respond to human needs regardless of um, what side they are on and separate from any political agenda that might uh, um, overlay the situation. Now, uh, in the early days of uh, Iraqi freedom, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Colin Powell, um, talked about NGOs, um, the non-governmental organizations, as a force multiplier for us and as part of the combat team. And humanitarians hate that. They don't want to be viewed as part of the combat team or as an enabler for uh, the military forces, even though it, it, there's understandable reasons in, uh, in viewing them that way from our, uh, or from the military's perspective. Now, humanitarian uh, actors um, kind of have s sort of found themselves in two camps. And, um, Weiss in his book talks about this pretty extensively. Those two camps being what he calls the classicists that, that have the sort of classical humanitarian view of things with the, the humanitarian principles, emphasizing humanitarian principles that you see there. And, and their view of the military largely is the military should just stay away. If, the, if they want to help, keep out as kind of their, uh, their, their view. Um, Weiss looks at another group of humanitarians, um, and he calls them the solidarists. The, uh, and, and they don't 
in many cases place such a high premium on neutrality, but they will actually take sides on the part of victims. They will advocate for certain uh, uh, political uh, solutions to, uh, to problems. And um, many of these humanitarians and I would put Weiss in that in that category. You know, as you as you read through what he has to say, um, see a very uh, important role for the military to go in and write humanitarian disasters or correct humanitarian disasters. In other words, use force if necessary to stop perpetrators from conducting uh, terrible things against innocent people. So these, uh, these two camps are very much at odds, and you can view both camps as humanitarians, but they have very, uh, very different views on, uh, on the use of the military. Okay, now, as you start reading into this field, uh, the, the term genocide comes up a lot, mass atrocities uh, come up a lot. Uh, the two terms are not synonymous. Um, genocide does have a legal definition, and you can see the definition that's usually accepted, uh, which was developed at the 1948 Convention on, on Genocide. And note that it talks about uh, certain types of groups, uh, national, ethnical, racial, or religious. And, the, uh, and genocide is the effort to eliminate in whole or in part members of one of those groups. Now, those, notice that the types of groups that, are, that were agreed upon there do not include political groups, do not include economic classes, do not include members of a sexual orientation or anything like that. So, strictly speaking, if somebody decides to eliminate all members of a political opposition party or anybody that aligns with the political opposition party, that would not come under the legal definition of, uh, of genocide. What it probably would come under is the unlegal definition of mass atrocity, which does not have a accepted legal definition. It's kind of like a broader, um, uh, ill-defined category, which you know, we can argue about what exactly is or is not a, uh, a mass atrocity. So uh, in, in, milita in US military doctrine, uh, we loosely define mass atrocity uh, there, widespread and often systematic acts of violence against civilians by state or non-state armed groups, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some of the definitions, differences between mass atrocities and genocide is mass atrocities could include the attempt to eliminate some of those groups that aren't covered by genocide. It, it could also include widespread acts of violence that aren't necessarily intended to eliminate a group, but these acts of violence are, are occurring anyway. So, uh, so a mass atrocity situation may not have an eliminationist intent. Um, some, and Weiss is, is one of these, would kind of view mass atrocities as a catch-all phrase or shorthand for what, what are called the four main crimes, uh, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity and, uh, and ethnic cleansing. And just the last comment on this before we move on. Probably all genocides are mass atrocities, but all mass atrocities aren't necessarily genocides. Now you can kind of uh, survey history and find some exceptions to that. For example, uh, in, uh, you, know, you could uh, come up with a genocide that wasn't really just a, uh, wasn't really a mass atrocity just because of the numbers involved. For example, in uh, 1763, uh, in the area and around Lancaster, there was uh, an event called, uh, that became known as the Paxton Boys Massacre. And what it basically was, was a bunch of frontiersmen got all fired up with uh, all sorts of ardor, and they massacred the Conestoga tribe, which consisted of about 20 to 24 members. And arguably that was a genocide, but not necessarily mass atrocity because, you know, we're only talking about a, a couple of dozen people. Okay, now looking at some of the past cases of, uh, of genocides and mass atrocities, and, and this is just since uh, uh, 1900. Um, and this is, by the way, just one person's portrayal, you know, different 
uh, analysts, you know, uh, would view, you know, well, first of all, they disagree on the numbers. They disagree on what these incidents or events should be called. They uh, they disagree and as to whether something should even be um, uh, included in a particular group of uh, of mass atrocities or uh, or uh, genocides. Um, Okay, now what I'm going to ask is for the technicians to go ahead and, and queue up the film. So just pretend that that map is, uh, is still on there. But, but of the events over the past 100 plus years, a couple in particular stand out. The Holocaust, of course, is, is the centerpiece. And after the Holocaust, you know, the world said, never again, but it's happened again. And uh, in some of the particular events since the Holocaust, the Cambodia killing fields, which may not, you know, although it's called a genocide, you know, again, going back to the definition of genocide beforehand, uh, that we talked about beforehand, uh, may not uh, precisely fit that uh, definition uh, because the people that were targeted weren't really of a particular ethnic group or of a nationality, um, but, you know, it was like um, pretty much everybody, um, you know, especially intellectuals city dwellers and, uh, and, and so forth. Rwanda in 1994 was a major turning point um, of sorts. We'll talk more about that, but then and some of the others that come to mind, uh, Srebrenica in uh, Bosnia in, in uh, 1995. And what we're going to do is um, um, I'm going to show you a 5 to 30 minute video of a uh, interview uh, that was conducted at the Holocaust, U.S. Holocaust Museum um, the person being interviewed is a is General Romeo Dallaire, currently a senator in uh, in Canada, who was the commander of the UN mission that was in Rwanda in 1994 uh, when the genocide there uh, started. And if you could go ahead and run the film, please. It's actually 13 minutes long, but. Rwanda, one of Africa's smallest nations. Known as the land of a thousand hills. For three months in 1994, Rwanda experienced genocide. Years have gone by, but the country remains scarred. Here, one man has found his father's body and will finally be able to provide a proper burial. Canadian General Romeo Dallaire witnessed the genocide as commander of a small UN peacekeeping force stationed in Rwanda. In June 2002, he spoke at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum about how the genocide might have been prevented and about his own struggle with the memory of failing to do so. You can't just say, well, it's eight years ago or nine years ago, and you did what you could. Um, did I do everything I could? Did I have all the tools? On April 6th, 1994, Rwandan President Juvenal Habyarimana was assassinated when a missile shot down his plane. Extremist leaders of the country's Hutu majority took the assassination as the signal to launch their carefully planned campaign of extermination against leading Hutu moderates and the country's entire Tutsi minority. The extremists seized control of the government. Tutsi of all ages were left without refuge. <laughs> They were hunted down and killed in their homes, at roadblocks, in schools, in churches. In 100 days, as many as 800,000 people, including three out of every four Tutsi in Rwanda, were murdered. You can't imagine the smell, the sound of dogs eating humans throughout the night, howling by the hundreds. 
of seeing children uh, living amongst the corpses of their families because there's nowhere else to go and there's no orphanage and nobody could pick them up at the time. In the middle of this horror were General Dallaire and the poorly equipped UN force sent to keep a peace that the extremists had suddenly, violently shattered. You have no food, water, fuel, medical supplies, defensive stores, because none of the contracts had been signed six months into the mission by the UN staff. Countries had not provided troops with equipment, so you got uh, Bangladeshi troops coming in with not even a pot to be able to cook their food. Three months before the genocide began, General Dallaire had learned of extremist plans for mass murder and told his UN superiors that he was going to seize an arms cache. The response was immediate, within hours, that uh, I was not authorized, it was outside my mandate, uh, and that I was jeopardizing the whole mission. Well, on the 6th of uh, April, uh, the war started. Within 24 hours, I had 10 soldiers dead, but already thousands of Rwandans were being slaughtered. After the killing started, General Dallaire requested more forces to stop the murders. Within the first few days of the Rwandan war and genocide, Kofi Annan went to all 69 countries. Not one of them, one of them, provided one soldier. Although no nation would send troops to help the Rwandans, Western soldiers did arrive to evacuate Westerners. And so all the expatriates, within five days, picked up what they had, left the Rwandans who had served them for years, decades, who raised their kids, left them to be slaughtered behind, and went back to Brussels and Paris and all these other places. The world turned its back on Rwanda. Two weeks into the genocide, the UN Security Council voted to reduce Dallaire's force to a token level. The killing continued for weeks. One hundred days after it began, the genocide ended when a Tutsi-led rebel force, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, drove the genocidal government out of the country. General Dallaire left Rwanda in August 1994. He still struggles with the memory of what he witnessed. You just can't walk through with all that blood and all that gore and all that sound. Did I or should I have walked up to Kofi Annan or Butos Ghali and throw my commission in front of him and say, to hell with you, nobody's coming, so I'm going. Should I have commenced opening fire the first morning? It was made very clear to me that if I opened fire, I would become the third belligerent because then it's open season. But with the force I had, there was no way that I could open fire and guarantee the security of my force. I didn't have enough ammunition to be able to hold out in a firefight for more than half an hour. No, there is no conceivable way of actually being able to walk away uh, from the immensity of what it is. And imagine the moral dilemmas we had of all those people calling that morning, screaming at the end of the phone for me to send troops to get them, and hearing the people smashing down the door and shooting them at the end of the phone or deciding which ones I could go and rescue and which ones I couldn't go rescue. Of the moral dilemma of the soldier who's all of a sudden seeing a crowd encouraging a girl of 14, 15 with a machete and a child on her back to kill another girl of 14, 15 with a child on her back. What do my soldiers do? They're held up at a, at a, at a the entrance of a village and they see these hundreds of people edging on this girl to kill another one. Do my soldiers open fire into the crowd, killing God knows how many and injuring to go save that girl? Does the corporal who's 19, 20, 21 coming out of our same schools, does that corporal take his sniper and 
orders him to shoot the girl with the machete, probably killing her child. Does the corporal simply walk away with his guys? What's the answer? What is the answer? What will he be held accountable morally? And what will he be held accountable technically? If he had to open fire, he went directly against the mandate and God knows what the reaction was. He didn't open fire. He negotiated and negotiated and as he's negotiating, this girl was being chopped up and her child was chopped up. And the crowd roared. And it was finished. That corporal of 21 came back home. And back home, we had Nightline, and we had hockey, and we had everything else. The country's not at war. There's no war. Rwanda didn't affect our security. They went there because there was a belief that there were humans who needed help and found themselves totally incapable of providing that help. And they come back with this new generation of injury called post-traumatic stress syndrome that in fact affects the brain because those moral dilemmas not being solved remain. And that's what we lived. Imagine what the Rwandans lived. I sent a, a section of two vehicles to a house where we suspected there were people there that needed to be pulled out. They didn't find them. So they came back and the next day I said, go check just in case. The next day they went and the whole family was slaughtered on the floor. They didn't find them because the family wasn't sure whether or not they were UN or simply people dressed up and using the UN, so they hid in the ceiling. The militia saw the troops going to that house, and so they tore the place apart and slaughtered them. Sometimes you were wondering whether going to help them was putting them in danger. This is not four or five people on a block. These is thousands upon thousands upon weeks and weeks and weeks. And the Western world sat there. You've got to start wondering about the depth of your belief in the moral values, the ethical values and your belief in humanity. All humans are human. There are no humans more human than others. That's it. Now, there are some other cases uh, around the world to um, be concerned about. And uh, there are several organizations that have different watch lists. Uh, one of the more prominent um, organizations called the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. You see there on the left uh, the, uh, the um, areas that they see are particularly at risk. Um, Kenya, as you recall, in 2007, 2008, had uh, some significant post-election violence that turned into tribe-on-tribe uh, um, uh, tribe, um, uh, murdering that resulted in uh, 1,300 killed, about 600,000 people displaced, and Kenya's got an election coming up next month, and that's a, 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 a particular area of, of concern. Um, the International Crisis Group has a different list that you see on the right of, uh, of crises that they are concerned about, and they, the lists don't, natural, don't automatically match, but one of the things I'll kind of point out is that in any crisis that erupts into conflict, mass atrocities may not be that far down the, uh, down the path. In January of 2011, uh, nobody had Libya 
on their watch list of potential mass atrocity situations, and the month later it, uh, it, it was. Okay, uh, different scholars have looked at uh, you know, uh, mass atrocity situations historically and have gleaned different lessons uh, from them. Uh, a, a person by the name of Gareth Evans, who was, uh, uh, in addition to other um, uh, uh, roles, was uh, Australia's foreign minister uh, for a period of time, and uh, published a book called The Responsibility to Protect, uh, which we'll talk more about. And uh, those are the, the kind of like the five main elements that that he gleaned as, uh, as contributing to um, potential mass atrocity situations. Uh, you know, one of the things that often comes up is, uh, is ancient ethnic hatreds. Uh, how much is that a contributing factor? And quite honestly, the literature is uh, divided on it. Some say that the, um, the ancient ethnic hatreds is a, a, a big part. Others say that's really kind of a red herring that uh, really what's more to blame is political manipulation by leadership that, uh, that kind of inflames the uh, you know, uh, ethnic rivalry and uses it for political advantage. Uh, there's a, uh, um, uh, a scholar named uh, Gregory Stanton who looked at how genocides progress and he came up with these eight stages which um, if you take a, a case like the Holocaust, it seems to apply. Uh, but other, uh, other scholars kind of disagree to the extent that this is sort of a, a blanket template that, that applies in all cases. Um, polarization, you know, kind of what that kind of talks about is uh, discriminatory laws, exclusion from types of employment, uh, seizure of property, uh, those sorts of things. Now, the, uh, the topic of humanitarian intervention and when is it right to uh, intervene in the affairs of another country, it kind of got turned on its head in, in 2011 with the release of, uh, of a report called The Responsibility to Protect. And, and really, it said that uh, it kind of turned the argument around. It's not so much whether or not outsiders have the right to intervene. What's really at issue is that a sovereign government has a responsibility to protect its citizens. So, uh, in other words, a, a government just can't have blanket license to abuse its citizens uh, for whatever reason. That, it ha that sovereignty implies responsibility. And that if a state is complicit in mass atrocities, or is unwilling or unable to stop mass atrocities, then it, it loses its claim to sovereignty and moreover, the rest of the uh, world has an obligation to do something to protect those, uh, those citizens. Now, R2P, as it has been called, is, uh, has gained a lot of traction in the past uh, decade plus. Uh, there are really two uh, existing frameworks for R2P. The first one, as originally codified by the ICISS report, uh, the prevent react, rebuild framework is, uh, is, is one. Um, subsequently, R2P was adopted by the United Nations, and the United Nations articulated three pillars for the responsibility to protect that you see there. So uh, uh, th these two frameworks aren't contradictory, but they are, they are different. And, and for those of you who uh, want to you know, pursue this topic further, you know, just, uh, uh, just be aware of the, uh, of the difference. R2P originally did get a lot of pushback from various countries. It's been progressively more and more accepted um, in, uh, in recent years. Now, uh, when looking at uh, humanitarian intervention or R2P, uh, the ICISS report articulated six criteria uh, that you see there. Um, I think one of the controversial issues is the, is the one about right authority. And the, the report says, ideally, the United Nations Security Council resolution is the authorizing agent that says we need, we the world need to go into a particular situation and do something about it. Um, the question comes up is what happens if the UN Security Council is unable to come to a resolution about something? You know, the Security Council has 15 nations, five of which are permanent members who have a veto power. And if one of those members of the P5 vetoes a resolution, 
then the resolution uh, doesn't pass. So the question is, if that happens, um, then what? Now, uh, and, and honestly, people are divided about this. Some say that without secure, Security Council resolution, you can't do anything. Others would say, well, maybe there are um, alternative sources of legitimacy. So, for example, if the Security Council vote is uh, 12 to 3 in favor of an intervention, and one of those three opposing it is a uh, member of the P5, that still you have enough uh, support for an intervention that that's more legitimate than if the, the vote was, say, 3 to 12, uh, for example. Or maybe if the General Assembly votes on a resolution, or if the African Union votes on a resolution. Um, so, that, so there's uh, different views on, uh, on that particular issue. Uh, with the intervention in Kosovo, that was done without a UN Security Council resolution beforehand. So Co the Kosovo intervention is widely looked at as technically illegal, but legitimate. Uh, UN approval came uh, subsequently. Um, you know, the, the, the right cause, the right intention. One of the challenges is that a objective in a particular situation is, or the objectives in a particular situation are likely to be very conflated. I mean, humanitarian goals may be one reason, but there could be other goals as well. Um, you know, regime change, for example. Um, if you look at uh, Libya, which many, most would view that as a kind of a classic humanitarian intervention, but there are some skeptics that would say, no, it wasn't. Um, but um, you know, one objective, the primary objective, uh, was to prevent atrocities. But there were other objectives as well, such as to not let the Arab Spring be, uh, be uh, squashed uh, by a dictatorial regime. And so the thing is that many of, in many situations, these objectives kind of intermix, and it's hard to separate purely humanitarian ones from, uh, from political ones. If you look at uh, Mali uh, these days, Mali probably is not a primarily humanitarian intervention. Uh, the, uh, there are other reasons why uh, the French are, th are there and ECOWAS is, uh, is there. Uh, but humanitarian reasons are an important part of the fabric, you know, I would, uh, I would, I would argue. Um, we had a uh, uh, French military colonel uh, contact us uh, about two weeks ago asking for um, our literature and, and, and uh, our advice on uh, mass atrocity prevention. And uh, yeah, while that wasn't probably the primary reason why France has sent forces to Mali, it's still there on the, uh, on, on the fringes of their, their intervention. Okay, I kind of mentioned that there was uh, some skepticism and reservation about R2P, and that does, uh, that does exist. Uh, you can see some of the, the main categories of the reservations or objections to RTP there. The, you know, there's the belief that states are sovereign and uh, you know, other countries shouldn't mess in a, in a country's internal affairs. Um, the, uh, the, the concern about colonialism or neo-imperialism that I alluded to earlier. Um, the, um, you know, the, the sort of post-mortem of the, the Libyan inter intervention, uh, while many, particularly in the U.S., view that as a successful uh, demonstration of R2P, there was some, uh, some backlash uh, internationally. Uh, there was um, uh, the, the impression by many that the mandate was exceeded, that you know, the UN mandate, UN Security Council Resolution 1973, uh, talked about protection of civilians and talked about R2P, but it didn't say anything about regime change, for example. Uh, there was concern about uh, some of the collateral damage that did occur, although in, in my view that was uh, uh, very minimal, but also on accountability to the UN. Uh, in effect, NATO was a deputized agent and there are some in the, in the UN or some that think that, well, the UN wasn't kept properly informed. I'm not saying I agree with that, but that was uh, one of the concerns. So um, there was a, subsequent to that, a um, 
concept advanced or initiated by Brazil, uh, talking about the responsibility while protecting. And that's kind of taken on a whole life of its, of its own, um, which maybe we can talk more about in the, in the Q&A session. Um, going up to sort of the middle of the list, you see national interest there. And, and one of the main sets of objections or reservations or concerns, I think, aren't so much whether um, it's legitimate for the international community to inter intervene in a country, but whether a particular, co particular country should invest the treasure and blood in an in intervention. And, you know, kind of back up a, a, a little bit, if uh, you remember 1982, we sent um, a contingent of Marines to Lebanon, and we did it, uh, actually we did it twice, and you could argue that that was a humanitarian intervention. In fact, I would strongly uh, argue that it, that was a humanitarian intervention. And if you remember, in, uh, in, they were there for over a year, and in 1983, there was a bombing of the Marine barracks and uh, also uh, co uh, simultaneously a bombing of the French barracks. There were 241 uh, U.S. military killed, mostly Marines, 220 Marines, and in the French barracks there were uh, 58 French paratroopers that were, uh, that were killed. After that, uh, the Secretary of Defense uh, articulated what came to be known as the Weinberger Doctrine for the commitment of, uh, of U.S. forces, and it included six principles, and I think it's important, you know, we haven't really talked about the Weinberger Doctrine much in, in recent years, but I think it's important to sort of view the concerns that were expressed in it. Um, you know, he, he said that uh, the U.S. should only commit troops when vital national interests are at stake, or those of our allies. That they should only be committed when they're, uh, they should only be committed wholeheartedly with a clear intention of winning. That there should be uh, clearly defined political and military objectives with the capacity to accomplish those objectives. That the relationship between ends, ways, and means should be continually reassessed and adjusted as necessary, that they should be committed only with a reasonable assurance of support from the American people and Congress, and only as a last resort. Now, um, that was kind of Weinberger's takeaway from the Lebanon intervention. Um, everybody doesn't agree with that, in particular uh, uh, you know, the Secretary of State at the time took issue with such a limited view of when U.S. military forces should be committed, but I think it's, it's useful to bear those in, in mind. Okay, moving on to a couple of other related uh, topics. Um, the protection of civilians has emerged in recent years as another kind of major area of focus by the State Department and the UN and, and uh, many who pay attention to these sorts of issues. It's sometimes viewed as a more preferred term than R2P, but they, don't, they, they aren't the same thing. Uh, but there are uh, different understandings of what protection is, of civilians is all about, what it should include. Is it just protection from violence or does it include you know, uh, protection from diseases and, and, uh, and other, uh, other human security threats? Um, since 1999, UN missions have routinely included protection of civilians clauses in their mandates. Now, in the film, you remember uh, General Dallaire kept talking about how he, he couldn't take certain actions because they weren't within his mandate. That, that uh, particular problem has largely um, been addressed because most mandates include some language like you see there at the bottom, that the mission is authorized to take the necessary action within their capabilities to protect civilians. Um, Dallaire didn't have that authorization back in 1994. Typically, they do. Now, uh, that, so that is, that's something. Um, there's sure uh, plenty of wiggle room in that, in that uh, language that you see there, a lot of room for interpretation, but at least it is uh, in, in some uh, ways a step forward. And just one last thing on POC for now, put in the shameless plug for uh, our reference guide that we just published on the protection of civilians, and you can see the cover of that down there at the bottom, and uh, you can get that from our website if you so desire. Um, moving along on this, uh, on this landscape, um, 
in August of 2011, President Obama signed a Presidential Study Directive, PSD 10, on mass atrocities. Uh, that's uh, Weiss in his article that I know you've all memorized, uh, kind of talks about it in, in some great detail. But as a follow-up to the um, Genocide uh, Prevention Task Force uh, report, uh, which was done in 2008, um, and this, I also commend this uh, to your um, reading list if you, if you have the time. Um, but what it did say was that pre preventing mass atrocities is a core national security interest of the United States and a moral responsibility. And one of the things that it was after was to prevent a situation or preclude a situation where the president has a choice between doing nothing or a co full coercive intervention, that there are other measures in between that can be explored if we start looking at it seriously um, far enough in advance. Uh, as a result of the PSD-10, there's been a, a high-level atrocities prevention board that's, uh, that's been formed, and we can talk maybe more about that in the question and answers as well. A uh, couple of related documents, again, shameless plugs. Uh, uh, we worked with the uh, Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at uh, Harvard University and developed a handbook on mass atrocity response operations. This is intended for military planners. Uh, we, you know, we're not saying uh, we should or shouldn't be doing MAROs, but if a military force is tasked to do uh, MARO, here are the considerations that it should, should look at and, uh, and how you know, it might conduct its planning and operations and that's also uh, available online. Uh, subsequent to that, we did a similar guide uh, for the policy community because some would argue the problem really isn't in the military, it's the political decision-making about using force or not. Uh, some of the things that we talked about in both of the documents are the, the types of actors that are involved in the mass atrocity situation, and we categorize them as you, uh, as you see there. Um, with the caveat that in many cases it can be hard to distinguish between groups. In other words, you could envision a particular group that's both the perpetrator and a victim in a, uh, in a situation, especially if, the situa especially if the tables are turned, the balance of power shifts, and what the group that used to be the victims now has the upper hand and the motive for revenge it can, uh, it can then turn into uh, perpetrators. And so there's all sorts of uh, dynamics between the, uh, the different uh, actors. Uh, talking a little bit about the perpetrators, um, many times it's important to recognize that from their perspective, the perpetrators may have legitimate objectives. Um, their means may not be uh, legitimate, but their, their goals might be, if, if not legitimate, at least understandable. Uh, there's a lot of good literature on perpetrators. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's important to note that there are different categories or different levels of the perpetrators. You know, you have the architects, the, the Hitlers, if you will, the facilitators, the Eichmanns, um, and then the foot soldiers, who are the thousands and thousands of people that it takes to conduct a genocide or mass atrocity that, actually, that you know, are the ones that actually get their hands bloody that uh, in many cases are not that different from you and me, which is uh, kind of a, um, a paradox in, in all of this. A couple books I'd commend to your reading, uh, one by Chris Browning uh, called Ordinary Men, where he looks at a, uh, a SS police unit on the Eastern Front in World War II, and these were all people, you know, kind of like middle-aged men from Hamburg, many former policemen, they had families, and they were just kind of normal people, and how could they do the terrible things that they did? Another one uh, by uh, James Waller called Becoming Evil, which, uh, which doesn't limit it just to the Eastern Front of World War II, but kind of surveys many other situations as well. Uh, the last group of actors will talk about the, the, the other actors, and I want to just make sure that we don't dismiss these as uh, kind of a grab bag of of uh, actors in the miscellaneous drawer that don't count. In many cases, these can be the decisive voices or the decisive influences in, uh, in a mass atrocity uh, situation. Um, third party enablers, those that provide monetary resources or weapons 
or moral support to perpetrators may be uh, the actors that, that, uh, that we should be trying to influence. On the, uh, on the victims, um, one, one thing to just be aware of, uh, I mentioned in Kenya there were 1,300 believed to have been killed by the immediate post-election violence and 600,000 displaced. And we often overlook the 600,000 displaced, but what that really translates into is a lot of other ways in which civilians can be harmed. And uh, there was a study by the International Rescue Committee on the uh, violence in the Congo during which four million people have been killed. But according to their report, um, for every person who died from violent means, 62 died from uh, disease, malnutrition, dehydration, accidents, or other, uh, other causes. Now, um, there, there is a lot of debate about the accuracy of the report, and, and, and some are skeptical about the figures, but I think the, the important thing isn't whether, it, the important thing isn't so much whether the ratio is 62 to 1, or 37 to 1, or 8 to 1, or whatever, but the point is, is that um, the, when people are displaced from their communities, from their families, they become even more vulnerable to, uh, uh, to bad things happening to them. Um, these days there's a lot of focus on prevention and obviously prevention would be better than responding to a mass atrocity situation because you have fewer lives lost, uh, the resources that are required are probably less. Uh, the, one of the questions about prevention is whether you address the symptoms or the root causes and this is known in, in some of the literature as direct prevention or structural prevention. Um, in the interest of time, we'll kind of skip over this. But uh, many of the preventive methods that really need to be pursued are related to development. Of course, one of the challenges is many countries, um, they, you know, you could, you, they need all the development they can get, and there's really no end to the, uh, to the requirements uh, that need to be satisfied. Um, mi the military is often used or viewed as the uh, resource of uh, last resort, uh, but I just, the intent of this slide is to point out that the military does have a potential role in the preventive context as well. Um, you know, whether it's rattling the saber uh, to deter perpetrators or, um, or help enable other actors or through training host nation security forces in, in addition to training them how to shoot weapons and stuff, but also to train them in things like respect for human rights and, and how to treat civilians and, uh, and those sorts of things. In our moral handbook, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit and talking about actual intervention, we describe seven different approaches in terms of how military forces can be used in a coercive intervention. Now, these approaches aren't mutually exclusive. You know, you could have a, uh, a, an operation that really includes or blends together several different approaches, either at once or sequentially or different parts in, uh, in different countries. Um, and, and that's likely going to be the case, that, uh, that they are going to be uh, um, integrated as opposed to relying on one exclusively. Uh, all of the approaches have you know, the situations in which they may be appropriate and they have their advantages and disadvantages. So for example, if you, you know, talk about a safe area, if you don't have a huge amount of forces, maybe the best utilization of them is to concentrate on places where vulnerable civilians are, co are, are collected, like uh, displaced persons camps or certain villages or, or whatever, and you try to secure those. Um, you know, so that may be to the good, but then you can see some of the downfalls of this approach because if you're securing those safe areas, what about the other places where you're not securing? Those people are still vulnerable. Or if uh, civilians decide that they want to move to the safe areas, then they're exposed as they are trying to move to them. And then finally, there's the, the problem that for the perpetrators, in some cases, you make their lives easier because you get all the eggs in one basket and those safe area uh, um, locations can be targeted, which was the case with Srebrenica 
uh, in 1995. And similarly, all of the approaches that you could take do have uh, their, their downsides. When you talk about humanitarian intervention, you know, there's all sorts of risks associated with them. Some of them you can, uh, you can see here, uh, starting from the fact that it may not work, or it may be too late, or the guidance that you get, like uh, Dallaire had, is so, so vague or restrictive that you can't do uh, too much good. Um, you know, the, the potential that it turns into a quagmire. You know, you can find, you know, if you think of military interventions, uh, more often than not, they're intended to be very short-lived um, excursions, but they turn out to uh, last a whole lot longer. I, I seem to remember back in the 1990s, we were only going to be in Bosnia for six months. Well, you know. As as far as losses, you know, it's not just the fact that you might have a plane or a helicopter shot down, but you're, if you're in a situation where you're committing a small military force over a wide area, uh, those forces are going to be vulnerable. And uh, General Dallaire mentioned in the interview how early on in the conflict he lost 10 soldiers uh, pretty much right off the bat. That was a Belgian squad that was isolated, cut off, and murdered in a very brutal fashion uh, just because it was, you know, 10 people against 2,000. And uh, as a result of that, uh, remember they're there on a peacekeeping mission. Uh, Belgium, uh, in Belgium immediately decided, well, we're there for peacekeeping. There's no peace to keep, and they pulled their forces out. And the Belgians were Dallaire's best troops um, at, that, at that time. So and you have so you have situations where, uh, well, the marine bombing, the bombing of the marine barracks in Lebanon was a, another illustration that of that. You have cases where uh, you know small numbers of troops are uh, are taken as hostages and and everything else. So so you uh, so that that is definitely a risk when you're talking about uh, humanitarian intervention. Um, the international community can disagree about objectives, methods burden sharing, and a whole wide range of, uh, of other issues. Trying to think through the second order effects, you know, that can be difficult. Um, Mali, arguably, is a second order effect of Libya. I don't think too many people anticipated that, but, uh, but uh, that, that case could certainly be made. And then there's also the risk of inaction, not the least of which is that if you don't act against a perpetrator today, other perpetrators tomorrow are going to uh, potentially be uh, be motivated to do their bad things. The uh, the aftermath of an intervention is really potentially the uh, the biggest problem. Um, if you just go in, stop the killing today, and don't address the root causes, then you probably might have to go back in next Thursday because it's uh, it's all started back up again. Um, you know, in, in our organization, Peacekeeping Stability Operations Institute, you know, we, uh, you know, we look at a lot of the literature that's out there on reconstruction and stabilization, and, and I think most understand that it's not just a military or a security-related issue, but there's all these other political and legal and economic um, aspects as well, and in many cases, those are the, uh, are the most port important. Those are the areas that tend to be given short shrift and under-resourced, and we very seldom do that uh, adequately. Okay, and I'm about at the end of my uh, scheduled time, so uh, let me just wrap up here, and well, one more slide after this, but, uh, but this is really the, uh, the wrap-up. You know, th this lecture series is called the Great Decisions Lecture Series, and I think there's, there's no decision that's more important than when we commit our children to situations of potential harm. Now, the picture on the left is uh, from uh, the aftermath of the Sierra Leone Civil War, 1991 uh, to 2002, uh, during which about 50,000 people were killed, um, largely by uh, a group called the Revolutionary United Front, which uh, took over control over most of the country. But in addition to the, um, the victims who were killed, there are thousands upon thousands of other victims to rape, um, 
other violence. And the signature atrocity in Sierra Leone was amputation. And the sick joke that the perpetrators had was long sleeves or short. And the, the boy on the left has uh, had his arm amputated at the shoulder uh, to a machete or something. The, the girl there had her wrists hacked off. Now, uh, there was a, uh, an ECOWAS mission that uh, went in, uh, really was unable to cope with the situation, and then Operation Palliser in, in uh, 2000, a British contingent of about 1,200 troops, initially went in for a, a non-combatant evacuation mission, and it got expanded to support for UNAMSIL and defeat of the RUF, and they were eventually, uh, they were eventually successful. And um, that British force did have a few casualties, but not, uh, not too much. Now, I mentioned uh, you know, the Presidential Study Directive, which was a follow-on to the uh, Genocide Prevention Task Force report. There's a kind of a, a, a quote in the GPTF report about how the President needs options between doing nothing and sending in the Marines. And amen to that. Um, you remember that uh, General Dallaire, at the end of his remarks, he talked about how no human beings are more important than other human beings. And amen to that as well. Um, the Marine on the right is my son. And uh, what I would hope is that he doesn't get cavalierly committed and sacrificed in a situation where it's an impossible mission, under-resourced, in a place where um, you know, people have been killing each other for thousands of years and will continue, continue to do so. So you know, the choices are, as in the case with Operation Palliser, you know, some force was committed uh, you know, at a very modest level that did a lot of good, maybe too late to help the two, two people on the left. If they had gone earlier, maybe you know, they, they wouldn't have lost their limbs. So that's you know, the one side of the choice. On the other side of the choice is uh, you know, if, we do, if we don't do it right, um, you know, we have our service members and uh, you know, service members from other countries who are um, going to be at risk as well. So um, I don't know if it's a great decision, but it's a difficult decision. And really my intent was to, uh, uh, with this talk, was to make you as confused and of two minds about this as I personally am. Um, thank you.